I didn't think it would be quite this emotional, <laughs> but it actually is uh, quite emotional to come back to this church. The last time I was here, I was sitting up in the balcony in full rebellion against God and against everything. And so I owe this church a big apology. I'm not sure there are too many of you here that still remember uh, my years of rebellion, but uh, I am so thankful for the grace of God. God turned my life around and I've had the privilege of being in full-time ministry. I've had the privilege of watching God change people's lives. And there's no greater privilege in the world than to, than to be God's spokesman to share the truth about the God that I love. <clears throat> and uh, you know, I'm just so grateful. I. I <laughs> I won't tell that story here today, thank you, you're probably glad to know that, but <clears throat> right after John Kennedy was assassinated, had a, is in November, had a beautiful day, and several from this church decided that they would join their lunches together and have a potluck down at the park. And uh, I, I don't remember if it was Elder Ryber or Elder um, Hardwick, but they asked him to have the blessing before the meal. We went to a picnic table and everybody put their food out, several different Adventist families. And I remember he said, well, before I have, the, before I have this uh, blessing, and he turned and looked at me and he says, I had a dream about you, young man. God's gonna put you in ministry. And I can tell you that I, my goal for my life always had been to be a surgeon. I wanted to study for, to become a doctor. And the last thing, I didn't have a lot of respect for pastors, and the last thing I wanted to be was a pastor. Are you kidding me? And I remember when I got angry when he said that, and uh, we're driving home and my mom was gloating. And she said, I dedicated you to the Lord when you were a young man, and she said, I, I, uh, always felt God's going to do something through you. And I said, Mom, stop it. You know that since I'm a little kid, there's only one thing I wanted to be. I want to be a surgeon. I've helped my dad operate on cattle and do all kinds of things. And I wanted to help people uh, by being a doctor. And uh, I said, you know, I don't know what that old man ate too late last night, but if God wants to speak to me, he can talk to me direct. And my mom said, well, maybe he's talking to them because you're not listening. And that made me even more angry. <clears throat> and I decided right then and there, I was going to be so bad they'd never take me in ministry. But thank God... God had another plan. And I'm so thankful. And I'm so thankful for the prayers of this church and the little church down in Fall City where I had relatives and they, were, they made a list of all of us kids that left the church. They made it in alphabetical order. I was the head of the list because my name started with B and my, my relative, David Woodruff, was the bottom of the list, and those ladies prayed us back into the church, and we came back in alphabetical order. <laughs> now, folks, that only happens if it's a work of God, and that's the order they were praying for us. And David now pastors uh, the Dalles and Hood River and Wakakis. <clears throat> I read this statement, and I want to share it with you, but uh, I, I was, th this statement grabbed a hold of me. It's from Ellen White, Prophets and Kings 277. You know, the last couple of years with COVID, uh, the world has taken a real, the United States especially, taken a real turn away from God, away from reality, and uh, I never thought I'd see things happen so fast, so fast. We've seen every, Ellen White says, every principle of our Constitution will be violated, and we've seen that happen. 
this is what Ellen White wrote. The time is at hand when there will be sorrow in the world that no human balm can heal. 80,000 have died in Ukraine. Less than a year. The spirit of God is being withdrawn. Disaster by sea and by land follow in quick succession. How frequently we hear of earthquakes, tornadoes, destruction by fire, flood with great loss of life and property. Apparently these calamities are capricious outbreaks of disorganized, unregulated unreg forces of nature wholly beyond the control of man. But listen to what she says, but in them all, in them all, God's purpose may be revealed. They are among the agencies by which he seeks to arouse men and women to a sense of their danger. Have you been aroused this last couple of years? You know, volcano in Japan killed a bunch of people. The Oak Fire in California is destroying thousands of acres. As of Thursday, there were 275,000 acres burning in Oregon. Do you know that a couple weeks ago, uh, south of Tucson had 16 inches of rain in a couple of days? And uh, something like 800 cars got trapped in Death Valley. Couldn't get out of the roads. And you know, I, I think of of uh, all these calamities, earthquakes in Afghanistan, and you know, it goes on and on. You can't look at what's happening in the news and not feel like God's spirit is being withdrawn. And you know, as I was thinking about all these things, I remembered the statement that Ellen White makes that when the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come and claim them as his own. Is Christ's character perfectly reproduced in you? My wife tells me at times, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Anybody else can relate to that? I won't ask for a show of hands. You know, I don't want to say things to my wife that... You know, would I sound different if Christ was right there? You know, I want to be, and I want the church to be, those people through whom the light of God's presence can shine brightly into the darkness of this old world. But I want you to think about it. <clears throat> when I look at myself, I say, God, you still got a work to do. It ain't done yet. It's just not done. I've been a pastor for all these years. I love the Lord with all my heart. I want to serve him. I want to represent him. But sometimes there's moments of frustration and I don't know what it is, you know. And it comes out. And I'm embarrassed by it. I don't like it. You know, I want you to think about this. this is, I want to take you on a journey of where I went when I began thinking about that. <clears throat> and I, I want to start first by having a prayer and asking God's presence to bring conviction to your heart as it has to mine if any of these things apply to you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I, I'm so anxious to please you and to represent your character in my life. I don't want to be divisive. I don't want to sound impatient. Lord, I want your love to shine brightly through me. Please help your church, your people, to be so in love with you, spend so much time with you, that you will be reflected in each of our characters and each of our faces. That we sound and look like you. Lord, I just pray for your spirit to speak to us today. In Jesus' name. You know, Jesus was constantly 
surprising the disciples, both with his words and with his actions. He was challenging their way of thinking about themselves and thinking about others. He welcomed sinners into the kingdom and associated with people that the rabbis and religious leaders of the day shunned. They wouldn't touch him, wouldn't come near him. I wonder if we're still a little bit exclusive. The changes that he worked in his disciples' lives did not come instantly, and they did not come easily. You know, we've talked about that in our Sabbath school lesson. Our culture is fascinated with extreme makeovers and quick fixes. But I don't think there's a quick fix or an instantaneous transformation for those of us that are Christians to become Christ-like. I think it's a process and it takes time. As Christians, we can become addicted to these stories of miraculous changes, believing that if God's listening to our prayers, that every sinful urge we feel will be healed immediately. It doesn't work that way. Contrast that with the record of the Gospels. Now, I want you to think about it. The disciples spent over three years with the Lord, you know, probably 12 hours a day or more. And yet, look at them just before the crucifixion. They're sitting there at the communion table arguing about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. And they had done it before. James and John, called the sons of thunder, probably for a reason, they had got their mother to use a little nepotism and to ask the Lord to let her boy sit on the right and left hand when he came in his kingdom. And then you think of Peter's short fuse, you know. They came to arrest the Lord, and Peter, who had bragged about everybody else may leave you but not me, he pulls his sword. Now, what's he doing carrying a sword anyway? He pulls the sword and tries to lob the guy's head off. The only reason he missed, because the guy ducked, and all he got was his ear. And do you know he would have been tried and convicted and probably... uh, (laughs) <laughs> spent either a long time in jail or been hung for trying to kill the high priest's servant. But after the Lord picked up the ear, dusted it off, and stuck it back on, there's no evidence of a crime. And then they didn't want to tell anybody because well, how do you kill somebody that can fix things like this? I want you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 32. I want to show you where I get my title for my sermon today. Genesis chapter 32. And I want to give you a little Hebrew lesson. I'll give give you a couple words that you, I hope you'll never forget. Genesis chapter 32, look at verse 30. Now, remember that Jacob had just wrestled with the Lord. He's going back to face his brother, who he has stolen the birthright from. His brother's angry. Chapter 33, verse 1 says his brother's coming with 400 men because he wants to get revenge. But notice what happens. Jacob called the name of the place that he had met with God and wrestled with him all night. He called it, he called it Peniel. Now, the word pan in Hebrew is simply the word for face. But when they add to a Hebrew word the the word El, it stands for Elohim. So the name of the place is the face of God. Elohim, face of God, is the way it's translated. And so some of your Bibles will say that right in the margin. And then it says, I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Now, the word for face to face here is panim. And any time in Hebrew when you add an I-M to the end of the word, it's like putting an S. It makes it plural. Well, why don't they translate it faces to faces? Because that's what the word, original word says, faces. It's plural. Panim. Pan him. 
The reason is, according to the Hebrew scholar, when you have a word that's unique, that's like no other word, that the, the word can't contain the meaning, it goes beyond what the word would normally mean, then they take a word that should be singular and make it plural. So this is a time where his character has been changed. You remember after he wrestled with the Lord all night, God touched him and his hip was put out of joint and he limped the rest of his life. The human has to be put out of joint before the God can be revealed. And so now his name is changed, no longer supplanter, but now it's Israel. It's no longer the deceiver, it's, those, it's the one who overcomes. And so I want you to notice what happens. He meets his brother. It's recorded in chapter 33, and notice verse 10. And Jacob said, I pray thee, if now I found grace in thy sight, then receive my presence, my present at my hand. He brings him all these uh, sheep and goats and animals as a present. For therefore, I notice what it says, I have seen thy face, pan, as though I had seen the, now it's Pan M again, the faces of God. Why, do they, why does he say it that way? Because, folks, when we have been changed by the grace of God, guess what? Other people notice, and it changes their attitude toward us. His brother, who had come to kill him, but now, what's the characteristics of his brother? It's forgiveness, it's grace, and he embraces him. It's love. What's the character, characteristics of God? Turn to Exodus 34, and I want to show you when it talks about the glory of God, or... Uh, when it talks about the glory of God, or the character of God, or the name of God, God changes the names. But notice what it says here in uh, chapter 33, and I want you to look at verse 18. Moses says, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. He's asking to see the glory of God. And he says, I will make my goodness pass before thee. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. So the name and the goodness and the glory of God is all tied up in the character of God. And I will be gracious unto whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy unto whom I will show mercy. And then in chapter 34, when the Lord actually passed by, in verse 6, it says, he passed by before him and proclaimed, look at what he proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression. So, when it says faces, it's because God intends that his face be seen in every one of us. When the character of God is perfectly reproduced in his people, when they're gracious, long-suffering, they're full of kindness, forgiveness, justice, then guess what? Then we reflect the character of God, and he will come and claim us as his own. I think he lets our weaknesses and difficulties drive us to him. Keeping us close, miracles happen, but the inner transformation we so desperately desire can only be achieved over time. God seems to prefer it this way. Perhaps it's because he knows that it can only be maintained by a constant connection. Are you keeping that constant connection with him? Am I? You know, it's almost impossible to make significant changes in our life by simply willing those changes to happen. You ever notice that? The harder you try, it seems like every molecule in your body seeks to resist. Change happens when we turn our lives 
by surrender over to Christ. It's when we give up on ourselves. If we could save ourselves, then God wouldn't have had to die for us. Then we wouldn't need a savior. We can't do it, folks. The human nature is so strong, the fallen nature, that it, that nature will overpower us. Every one of us is sinners saved by grace. I, I want to give you an example that I think explains this better than anything I've ever read. Uh, it's about Dr. Richard Dawson. He was serving in the British Army during the World War, and he spent some time in a brutal Japanese prison camp. Daily, he watched, uh, he was a doctor, and he watched his soldiers dying from dehydration, things that were easily treatable during normal conditions. But the, the, the swamps and the rivers near the camp were full of uh, viruses and amoebas and stuff that gave them dysentery, and then they got dehydrated, and they were dying because of dehydration. And it drove him crazy. You know, he, he saw these people that were easy, things that were easily fixed during peaceful times, but he didn't have what it took to fix it. And then suddenly he remembered, it's like God brought to his mind that water inside of a coconut is sterile. He says, I don't know where I heard that. But he says there was coconuts growing all over around there. So he, he began to pick coconuts and hook up a pick line to a coconut and intervenous feed these soldiers coconut water, sterile water, and guess what? They all began to live. They all got better. You see, Dr. Dar Dr. Dawson marveled that those coconuts full of pure sterile, wa sterile water grew from that contaminated water and swamp and somehow, as they took that water up through their system, they purified the water. And, you know, I think about that. What a beautiful analogy of what Jesus does in our lives. When we are connected to his presence, the genetic and cultivated tendencies to sin no longer have power over us. He takes that contaminated influence of the world and turns it into something pure, something life-giving. I think that's a beautiful an analogy. He gives love and acceptance, and we have never known before, and he makes it possible for us to become all that he created us to be. I, I, I just love it. it, because it's a Bible principle. By beholding, we become changed, and the more we behold Christ, the more transformation takes place in our life. How many of you heard of Alice Cooper? I see a few old folks in the congregation. If you think it's a woman, it's, you're telling me your age. <laughs> Alice Cooper was one of the first shock jocks of rock and roll. He used to have a real raunchy act where he took live snakes and get on stage and you have snakes going all over him and he actually pretended to cut his own head off on stage. Really raunchy stuff. His career was the epitome of everything critics hate about rock and roll. He glorified rebellion, immorality, idolatry, excess, like practically no other rock artist. But guess what? In 1995, Alice Cooper gave his heart to the Lord. And guess what? He now belongs to a Bible church in Phoenix, Arizona. He works uh, in their soup kitchen feeding the homeless people. He sings in their choir. And you know, he, somebody interviewed him the other day and I happened to see this thing and he says, you know, my greatest joy is to read my Bible and learn more about the Lord I've fallen in love with. And you know, that's why his life is being transformed. He's staying connected to the source. How many have heard of Eldridge Cleaver? He was one of the best known militants. There's a hand, you know who I'm talking about. He was one of the best uh, known militants of the same area of the notorious Black Panthers gang or group. 
But do you know he's also become a follower of Christ? You know Christ transformed his life? He tells about it in a book he wrote called Soul on Fire. And he said that he got a vision one day. And he said all the people that he had formerly thought of as heroes were paraded before his eyes. Fidel Castro, Mayo Seitung, Karl Marx, Frederick Engels, all these guys came and he said he saw their lives and he saw the difference they made for a little while, a little splash on the, on the sea of humanity, and then their lives faded out. But he says at the end of the vision, he saw a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and he says that picture of the Lord kept coming closer and closer and brighter and brighter till it filled the room. And he said he realized that Christ was the real change agent that none of the others really were. And he said it changed his life. And he said, I'm never going to be the same. People whom you'd never have thought having a religious conversion have found meaning in the person of Jesus Christ. In the movie Apollo 13, Astronaut Jim Lovell was asked if he was ever afraid. You know, here's a guy that went to, into space. You know, he had done many hours on uh, some of our planes during wartime. And he said, there was one time he said, it sticks out in my memory when I was really afraid. I was returning from a combat mission. He said, I couldn't find the aircraft carrier. It was dark because we were under combat conditions. The carrier didn't have its lights on. He said radio navigation equipment was of no use because we were under radio silence to avoid detection. And he said to make matters worse, he said that we, I was running out of fuel. There was a light flashing, he said, that says extreme low fuel. Kept flashing on and off. And he said, I knew that if I didn't find my ship, real quick, I was going to be swimming. In a last attempt to determine his location, he turned his map light to see if he could calculate his position. And he said, suddenly, there was an electrical short. It caused all the lights to go out. And then he guessed what? He said, I looked down, and he said, the ocean was aglow. As a ship passes by, it stimulates the plankton, and it makes a green glow in the ocean. He said it was like a road map leading me right to the ship. He says, you don't know what will transpire to lead you home. If that map light had not shorted out, I would never have seen the glowing wake. Listen. Again. I want you to turn to Isaiah 60, verse 1 and 2, because I want to show you what God has promised us. Isaiah 60, verse 1 and 2. He tells us, Arise and shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. Do you think that applies to today? Gross darkness the people? But the Lord shall arise upon thee. He's going to do what? He's going to empower you. He's going to rise upon thee. And his glory shall be seen, of the, shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. You know, COVID-19 and things that happened this last year have made a lot of people real afraid. Many people have lived in fear. Some are fr afraid of the shot, some are afraid not to get the shot. Some, you know, we, we had all kinds of divisions through politics. But uh, attitude is really important. The reason we can walk boldly with confidence is something important has happened in our lives. If you get connected to Christ, you'll feel that power changing you. You'll see that you're you're, the things you once loved, you now hate. The things you once hated, you now love. You know, when I came here in rebellion, I hated going to church. Now you can't keep me away from it. You know, God has changed those things in me. 
But notice it says, for thy light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Notice it says that three times. And, but the Lord shall arise upon thee. His glory shall be seen upon thee. Christ has entered our lives and cast out the evil tendencies. And so once we have had that, we can tell people how to get the victory. Stay connected to the source. The reason we can rise and shine is because Christ has made a difference. I love that song we sing at camp meeting. It says... Uh, we have this hope that burns within our hearts, hope in the coming of the Lord. Hope, man, God given us a wonderful hope. We know how this thing's going to end. It's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. There's a time of trouble coming such as never was. But God, the, the darker it gets, folks, in the world, the brighter we as God's people are supposed to shine. We're supposed to show love and grace. Now, I want to take you to one more quick story. Turn in your Bibles to Acts Chapter 8, this is the story of uh, Paul, Saul, whichever name you want to start out talking about him, and his conversion. Now, I want you to think about this a minute. Saul, in chapter 8, verse 1, was consenting unto his death, talking about Stephen, and at that time, there was great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout Judea, Samaria, except for the apostles. And so here's Stephen, and he, uh, he's preaching the gospel, and who comes along but Saul, thinking he's doing what's right, he's protecting the church. He's working for the Lord like the devil. He really is. But he doesn't know it. You think there's people that are absolutely convinced that they're right? That are 180 degrees out of sync with the Lord's will? I think there's a lot of people like that. And, you know, it's only God that can change their ideas. Look in chapter 9, verse 1. It says, Paul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest, desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they be men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around him a bright light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, it's interesting, the names. Do you know what the word Saul means? Anybody here know? It means ask. And so the Lord says to him, ask, ask. So he finally asks, who are you, Lord? And then he says, I'm the one you're persecuting. Now, the light must have come on for Saul about that time, you know, he got knocked off his high horse. He's sitting on the ground in the dust. And I think he must have realized that God could have just as easily wiped him out. What had he just received? The grace of God. The mercy of God. Now he's blinded. What's the first thing he saw? Who can tell me? When his eyes were open, what's the first thing he saw? Somebody must know. Well, let me share the story with you. There was, it says, Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. He's blind. He sees no man. He was three days without sight. He sees nothing. Neither did he eat or drink. And there was a certain disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. And he said, I want you to rise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire of the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he may receive his sight. The first thing he saw was a guy named Ananias. Now, what does Ananias' name mean? 
You know, Bible names have meanings. It's the word Hanan. Hanan means grace. And then they add at the end, it's a Hebrew name. All the Jews had Hebrew names. They add at the end, Hanukkah. If you add Yah or Ka, it stands for Yahweh. And so, what had he received? The grace of God. Whose face does he look into? A face of a man called the grace of God. That's not by accident. It's the grace of God that changes people's lives. Paul was transformed not as a result of strict justice, what justice demanded, because he had, he had been hurting Christ. Christ says, why are you persecuting me? Every time one of God's people was suffered, Christ suffered. Why are you persecuting me? There was no retribution, no demand of Paul for his past sins, no penance, no doing time. God gave him grace. Who becomes the great preacher of grace? The Apostle Paul. And do you know what the word Paul means? One who sees. What had he seen? The face of God, the character of God. He had seen it in Ananias. He had seen it in his name. Ananias, was Ananias excited about it? He said, Lord, do you know who this is? Like, God doesn't know. Yeah. This is my servant. The one I've called. I want to close with one last story. Paul Powers was seven years old. His mother died of pneumonia. After his mother's death, Paul's father became an alcoholic. He also began beating Paul on a regular basis. He had a lot of in anger, losing his wife, and he took it out on Paul. Paul joined street gang for protection. Soon he spent all his time stealing and in street fights. At age 12, he killed a lady. He spent the next four years in a juvenile prison. At 17, he was removed from the prison and put in the care of an elderly couple named Mom and Dad Adams, who were Christians. Adams loved Paul in spite of his violent temper and his rough ways, and they were always ready to forgive him and give him another chance. And they had to forgive him over and over and over again. But Paul Powers met the Lord through the Adam family. He saw God's love in them. He had never experienced it before. They took him to an evangelistic crusade and he gave his life to Jesus. A few years later, he met and fell in love with a young Christian lady named Margaret. Margaret loved Paul, but after hearing about his rough background and that he had killed a lady, she wasn't sure she wanted to marry him. He took her down to the beach one day, and they were walking on the beach. And uh, she said to him, you know, the tide's washing out our footprints as they, they walked down the beach. When they came back, the tide had already washed their footprints out. She said maybe the relationship would be, their relationship would soon be washed away too. But Paul assured her. He said, you know, God has been with me. He's protected me all my life, even before I knew him. He was protecting me. God put me in a Christian home so I could learn what love was like. I'd never experienced it at home. And God sent me to an evangelistic series so I could learn who God is and what he's done to save mankind. And he says, I'm 100% committed to the Lord. And he said, God has convicted me that I should have a Christian wife and I would love to have you be my life partner because I know you're a good Christian and I love you. That night they became engaged. And after their romantic talk, Margaret returned to her room and wrote a poem based on trusting God, even when we can't see him working. It's a poem that is familiar to millions. I'm sure you've all heard of it. It's called Footprints. 
Paul Powers did not become the kind of man that Margaret loved because he made his mind to do so. Paul Powers was changed by the power of Christ's love. Seen in the faces of the Adams. Paul Powers was changed by the power of that love. That is the only way real change ever comes. I, the Lord, writes Isaiah, have called thee in righteousness. I will hold thy hand. I will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people and for a light to the nations. I'd like to share the words of that poem. One night a man had a dream. He was walking along the beach without the Lord. Across the sky flashed scenes from his life. For each scene he noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonged to him, the other to the Lord. When the last scene of his life flashed before him, he looked back at the footprints in the sand. He noticed that many times along the path of his life there was only one set of footprints. He also noticed that it happened at the lowest and saddest times of his life. This really bothered him, and he get questioned the Lord about it. Lord, you said that once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I've noticed that during the most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why, when I needed you most, you would leave me. The Lord replied, my precious, precious child. I love you and would never leave you. During your times of trial and suffering, when you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. I pray that the world will see the face of God in my face and in yours. That's the change agent that the world needs to experience. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for Jesus. I'm thankful for his power to change. I know that you still have work to do in my life, but you've promised to complete that work. Lord, help me surrender so you can finish the job. I pray that your church will be a lighthouse in this dark world, a place where people will see your character and be transformed by your love. Bless us, Lord. Help us to be that change agent through which your grace can be distributed to those that desperately need to experience it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.